We will continue in English with the last input, input speaker, Achie Swinnen. She studied comparative literature and focused across several studies, collecting culture, moving into the spheres of cultural science. And she does research into age and aging and looks at it as a characteristic of uh, social status um, in a, a like um, age uh, social difference. It is a topic that others um, work in as well. For the past five years, she has been the professor for age studies at the Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And in, since 2017, she's been the head of an interdisciplinary research group, arts, media and culture. In her presentation, she will look at three specific examples under the headline of age and aging and how that is represented in the arts, or maybe even reinvented and retold, reimagined rather. I'm looking very much forward to your talk that will be also in English. Okay, so thank you very much for inviting me. It's really a delight to be here. I also want to thank the translators because I've been listening a lot uh, to your work today. I think you're doing an amazing uh, job. Uh, and I hope that you still have the energy to listen to my talk. I'm the final presenter. Um, I'm not so sure if if this is something you want to listen to after all these uh, wonderful and moving images that we just uh, watched together. But, uh, well, let's, let's go for it. I would like to start by showing an ad or commercial um, by the Canadian Heart and Stroke Foundation. A student introduced it to me a few years ago in the framework of an assignment on finding and analyzing a cultural narrative about aging that circulates widely in our society. Could you please play the ad? Mehr Dachreparaturen, mehr Reinigungs. That's, the ad. <laughs> That's the ad before the ad. Yeah. <laughs> What will your last 10 years look like? Will you be quick enough for a game of tag with your grandchild? Strong enough to embrace every moment? Will you grow old with vitality? Or get old with disease? It's time to decide. The average Canadian will spend their last 10 years in sickness. Change your future at makehealthlast.ca. Thank you. So, as you can see through the clever use of split screen with visual analogies and different color schemes in combination with the dramatic music and voiceover, this commercial presents two alternatives of later life a seemingly positive and a negative one. The voiceover addresses the viewer to inquire whether he or she wants to be quick, strong and vital during the last decade of his or her life or ill. As we could notice, ill corresponds to institutionalized, deprived of any joy and isolated from grandchildren, friends and family, just left with a devoted and burdened wife who visits while the actual care is performed by a black nurse. The message is very clear. It's time to decide 
and to change your future, the ad says, thereby suggesting that it is in your hands which scenario of these two will materialize. In cultural gerontology and aging studies, the two alternatives presented here are what we call the successful aging paradigm, you have heard it before as active aging or healthy aging, in the Netherlands also vital aging, these are all kin discourses, versus the narrative of aging as decline. Neither of these are particularly satisfactory trajectories of later life, as they represent a contemporary secularized version of what we call bipolar ageism. And I just learned today that the term ageism doesn't even exist in, in German. So the notion of bipolar ageism was introduced, um, no, this should not be here yet, I'm sorry, yes. So the notion of bipolar ageism was introduced by the American historian Tom Cole in The Journey of Life to explain how, already since the early 19th century, perceptions of age could be categorized as either negative or positive. So-called bad old age, presumed dependency, sickness, sin, premature death and damnation, while its opposite comprise health, virtue, self-reliance and salvation. In the current secular version of bipolar ageism, the elements of sin and damnation versus virtue and salvation have disappeared. And although presented as a positive alternative to the negative aging in the decline narrative, Successful aging is just another side of the same coin. It emphasizes the responsibility of the older person to manage his or her health and autonomy through smart consumer choices, such as dieting, we have heard this several times today, exercise, plastic surgery, and self-help books. As such, it promotes an ideal of youth rather than that it ascribes meaning to the later stages of life. It seems that today, the ideal older person has not aged at all. The British sociologists Chris Gilliard and Paul Higgs connect the development of the secularized version of bipolar ageism with the rise of youth culture in the 1960s. And I quote, in the 1960s, aging bodies could only become salient as objects of otherness assessed, examined and judged for evidence of disablement and disease in the case of geriatrics or of disablement and need in the case of gerontology. There was no other market for the aging body, and without a market, no public expression or recognition of the aging body as a desiring body. Outside the hospital and the nursing home, the invisibility of the aging body was as complete as the economic marginality of the older citizen." End of quote. This changed, however, from the 1980s onwards, when bodily aging re-entered popular culture through this rhetoric of rejuvenation for all. This had led to new visibility of aging bodies, albeit terribly one-sided new visibilities. Older people are portrayed as consumer bodies in search for everlasting youth, and the difference between the successfully and the unsuccessfully aged has deepened. Gilliard and Higgs differentiate between the third and fourth age to refer to the successfully versus the unsuccessfully aged, which roughly corresponds with success versus decline. Through elaborating on Kristeva's concept of abjection, they want to understand the power mechanisms that underlie these categories as social imaginaries. Their application of the concept of abjection to aging helps explaining our effective response of fear and disgust to persons in the category of the so-called fourth age, who embody the stigma of old age as decline, which was the gloomy version in the ad that I just showed you. In the view of Gilliard and Higgs, third age offers more potential to transgress objection than fourth age because of these consumerist lifestyles that have developed and that became available to older people in relatively good physical, but also financial health. As a result, old age itself moved, and I quote, either chronologically upwards towards an age and a place that appears beyond the reach of such transgression, or buried deeper into sites of darker, more profound objection, end of quote. This is how the category of the fourth age is constituted. 
the meaning of the fourth age draws heavily upon observations and images of older people in institutionalized settings. What installs the disdain for this fearful other is even more than perceived physical and cognitive vulnerable vulnerabilities, this evident failure of social intent, the inattention that betrays self-control and self-direction. From this it follows that challenging the positioning of other is especially difficult in the fourth age, as performing everlasting youthfulness is now beyond reach. Nonetheless, Gilliard and Higgs propose two options to counter this dynamic of exclusion. The first is inspired by a feminist ethics of care that foregrounds the quality of intersubjective relations. We have heard this already today, luckily. And the second lies in the acknowledgement of the universal vulnerability of our bodies and our relationships, which we also already encountered. Indeed, one of the biggest problems with the successful aging paradigm is that the emphasis on individual agency and choice does not take into account human conditions of frailty, interdependence, vulnerability, and transcience. Sustaining practices of successful aging enables older persons in the so-called third age to distance themselves from persons in the fourth age, and thereby their dependent and frailer future selves. The real problem lies thus in the ability of people to see older people as an extension of their future or even present selves. It is particularly sad that, as Sarah Lam and colleagues point out, the successful aging paradigm is now exported globally and colonizes the existing models of aging present in other cultures that could have shown us points of exit from this paradigm. And we also saw a lovely one in the Japanese uh, nursing home. It is important to understand that the successful aging paradigm is profoundly gendered. What it means to age successfully differs for women and men. Older, mainly heterosexual women are often confronted with a so-called double standard of aging. The predominance of the male and youthful structure of the look makes it almost unthinkable to consider older women in terms of physical attractiveness and sexual desirability. I have included here the definition of the youthful structure of the look, um, which is inspired by the better known concept of the male gaze and here developed by Kathleen Woodward. I won't read it out loud. I think you all understand what it means. Older women are scrutinized and condemned for not continuously being able to embody the hegemonic script of youthful femininity into perfection. They have developed strategies, though, ranging from altering their appearance, think of Botox and plastic surgery and behavior, to avoid certain settings, to fight the social invisibility that comes with aging, and to negotiate gendered ageism. Although these strategies do reflect women's agency, it's always worth questioning whether they are accommodating or resisting discrimination. Beauty work that is meant to make bodily markers of aging invisible, for instance, sustains the lookism mentioned earlier as it, and is inevitably complicit in a denial of age itself. Because older men, especially affluent ones, are still considered more attractive and even sexy compared to older women, it may seem as if they are immune to ageism. Recent scholarship, however, has shown that gendered ageism is not exclusive to women. Older men's often self-declared immunity to ageism is connected to their ability to maintain hegemonic masculinity, an ideal that emphasizes class status and physical capability. Tony Calazanti and Neil King use the phrasing, and I quote, playing hard, and staying hard to illustrate how the really masculine older man has to engage in physical and sexual activity, which preferably a younger woman, of course, to resist potential losses of aging. They link the emphasis on the erect penis as an index of successful aging for men with the arrival and promotion of Viagra. Oh. 
So this is just one of the many, I'm sorry, one of the many cartoons about Viagra that play into this uh, narrative. Obviously, men who perform masculinity successfully in later life may fail to acknowledge the ageism that other men and women experience. I have two side remarks. The first is that the study of gendered ageism today focuses mostly on white and heterosexual men and women in a Western context. There is evidence that other groups of people have different experiences that need to be taken into account. An intersectional perspective helps to understand that differences in ageism may be experienced according to gender, sexuality, ethnicity, and class. My other side remark, oh, this is strange. Maybe this is not my last version because I added yesterday, but it's not a problem, it's, it's, it's fine, because I added it yesterday while preparing. I added the painting that we saw twice today by Lucas Cranach, the elder, of the Fountain of Youth. <laughs> and I added it because I wanted to show you that this quest for everlasting youth is as old as mankind itself, but that it always takes newer forms. And what we missed thus far today is that that particular painting is a satire. The women that go into the water, uh, the older people that go into the water are only women. And so it's only the women that come out rejuvenated from the water, while the male characters, also old and decrepit, they stay old and decrepit, and they wait for the younger women on the other side of the pool uh, where they engage uh, in sexual activity. So it's really a painting that not necessarily mocks female vanity, as some people think, but it mocks the older man here that lust after these younger women. So keep in mind that this is the 16th century, so this topic is rather old. <laughs> okay, so I would now like to delve into the domain of visual aging studies that addresses the mediality and contextuality of images of aging, and I will take a closer look at images from uh, three case studies that I have written about uh, in terms of their capacity to show how we understand, embody, and perform late life femininity, and to stimulate practices of looking beyond the male and youthful gaze and the stare of abjection. So why have I chosen these three? Um, first, because of course they move me in a certain way. Um, second, I decided to focus on femininity. I've also written on masculinity, but I had to make a choice. Um, they, all three of them, they also remind us of the performativity of age. Age is not just a bodily affair, but we are also aged by culture, to use the words of Margaret Goulet. One way to understand how we are aged by culture is to approach age identity from the perspective of Judith Butler's notion of performativity, as opposed to understanding age in, for instance, chronological, statistical, psychological, biological terms. So thinking of age as performative means that we think of it in terms of doing rather than being. And we all know that one can fail to act one's age. Think of saying such as you are too young or too old to do this or to wear that or to say so and so. And so what you risk is that you become the object of ridicule. On the other hand, transformation is to be found in the impossibility of the exact repetition of hegemonic age scripts, such as the successful aging paradigm, and its insistence on youthful beauty for older women. Exposing the naturalized status of these scripts through hyperbolic display might result in their subversion. And then finally, I think that these examples are subversive in their age performances and as inspiring to a certain extent. So let's start with the first one. This photo series, Mature by Erwin Olaf. Olaf is a Dutch photographer known for his artworks that show abject bodies in unexpected and rather shocking settings. Chessman from 1988, 
His breakthrough, for instance, includes black and white images of pregnant women and little people presented as pieces in a chess play with props that refer to bondage and sadomasochistic practices. Mature is a series of portraits of 10 ordinary women between 60 and 89 years old. It's from 1999. All women look into the camera. Their bodies are veiled and unveiled in ways that are reminiscent of sensual pin-up iconography. The photographer said about this particular series, the outside part of getting older is the skin, but with the help of makeup, wigs, and revealing clothing, I changed these women into actresses. I said to each to imagine she was a beautiful pinup of the 1950s. I said, you're gorgeous, don't move, stay like that, I'm just going for a packet of cigarettes. Then I come back 40 years later, walk into the room, step behind the camera and go click. That's the mood I wanted to get." End of quote. The pinup itself is a controversial figure. Where does the objectivation of women in pinup iconography end, and when do women appear as sexual subjects in their own right? This question is hard to answer according to Maria Elena Buzek, who argues in her book, Pinup Girls, that since its very beginning in the 19th century, the figure of the pinup was more than a spectacle to please the male gaze. Pinup iconography was part of women's attempt to become an integral part of the public sphere. During the Second World War, for instance, pinups were not only used to decorate lockers and airplanes for military men, but also in American governmental campaigns to convince women to take on jobs outside of the domestic realm. As such, it's not surprising that many women artists have turned the pinup in their search for a mediating image between the roles of subject and object and the language of transgression and tradition. One example is the Jamaican-American artist Renee Cox, who turns herself into the superhero Raji. Her series of self-portraits is political in that it shows a black pinup who intervenes in situations of discrimination on the basis of race. Here you can see her with this uh, Uncle Ben's and Aunt Jemima, a very problematic images. Um, but she rescues them, so to speak. Buzek writes that for Cox and other artists, performing as a pinup served to expose the very construction of the genre, revealing both its artificiality and performative nature, as well as its potential as an expressive medium for the woman so represented." End of quote. In my view, this photo series Mature by Erwin Olaf uh, should be interpreted in this artistic context. The most important visual intertexts of Mature are pinups by Gil Elfgren mostly known for his work commissioned by Braun and Bigelow, which is an American publisher of calendars. Today, I briefly want to concentrate on one photo entitled Helena C61, and is original to the right, a spicy yarn from 1952, an oil painting of a pinup with Elfgren's signature look of large eyes, well-proportioned body, tip-tilted nose, etc. The women in the images uh, strike a similar pose, but the visual humor has changed in the translation. The Elfgren pinup is a typical product of the 1950s. She is committed to the domestic activity of knitting, and her needles are still in the garment while she's trying it on. We are the voyeurs who peep into the scene and accidentally see the lower part of her bosom that is exposed. The pinup's coquettish smile makes her as available as the girl next door. The photograph of the real-life older woman has lost this kind of innocence. Her smile is self-reflexive and witty. This is the smile of a mature woman who has lived and who is a knowing subject. Maybe she laughs with the Elfgren pinup, a male fantasy that she's imitating, or maybe she finds her own performance amusing. Her name, Helena C., is also ironic, 
as it refers to the supermodel model Helena Christensen from the 1990s. And all of the older women photographed get this kind of uh, mock name. So to me, in my view, this Olaf pinup has an air of superiority rather than that we can feel superior to her. Her ironic smile and self-conscious gaze keep us at a distance. For this reason, it's difficult to look at her with pity or disdain because she's an older woman. The older woman is not portrayed as a needy consumer body whose age needs to be veiled. On the contrary, the unveiling of body parts comments on the default pinup mode of youth and accessibility to the right. Scholars such as Daniela Bruggeman and Anneke Smelik have argued that to make an erotics of age thinkable, we need an aesthetics that include older women's bodies. In my view, Olaf's pinups help us understand the importance of seeing and accepting the attractiveness of bodies and sexual agencies of older women. I move to my second example. Mumbling Beauty by Alex van Gelder. It's a photo book consisting of 81 photographs of Louise Bourgeois taken by Alex van Gelder in the final years of her life between 2008 and 2010, which is the year of her death. Louise Bourgeois is a figure that dismantles the very idea that creativity is a prerogative of youth. The artist was already in her 70s when she experienced an international breakthrough in the form of a first retrospective in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And she worked until her death at 98. In the preface of his book, Van Gelder recollects how Bourgeois became a consummate performer in front of his camera and how she chose him as a chronicler of her last years. Bourgeois has always been an avid performer in front of the camera. Kathleen Woodward, for instance, interprets this photograph from 1975 of an enigmatically smiling bourgeois wearing a latex bodysuit as reminiscent of an ovary releasing many eggs. In Woodward's view, this image presents a new kind of female body in older age, a creative female body that is not post-reproductive. The playful performance of this new productive body is precisely appearing at a time when reproductive technologies enable older women in and beyond menopause to have children, which causes a lot of controversy and anxiety, as you all know. Another famous image of Bourgeois is the portrait taken by Robert Mapplethorpe from 1982. Bourgeois looks into the camera with an ironic smile while holding her sculpture Fillette, which is a giant latex follows. The image is characterized by a discrepancy between the age of the sitter, as revealed by Bourgeois' wrinkled face and hands, and the sexual object that she's holding. Through posing with the phallus as a visibly older woman, Bourgeois challenges the idea that sexuality and older age are incompatible. And you can see the link between the pin-up performance of ordinary women in Olaf's photography and this performance of the artist uh, Bourgeois. As Rosemary Betterton writes, Mapplethorpe's photograph is more than a portrait of the artist as an old woman. It is a record of a particular performance of age and gender enacted by Bourgeois herself. Her burlesque upsetting of categories confronts our cultural horror of older women's sexuality, end of quote. In the photo book Mumbling Beauty, Bourgeois is not just shown as an older woman artist playing with gender and age scripts. There is a diversity of images that together give the viewer an impression of the many different people Louise Bourgeois is, has been, and aspires to be. There are several portraits that show an artist who is in control, still working in her studio, posing with her artworks, or consciously role-playing in front of the camera. Other images show a bourgeois seemingly out of control, raging and uglifying herself to the extent that, she's almost, that she almost uh, becomes a death mask. Close-ups of bourgeois' face, sometimes in the shape of distorted mirror images, show different effects ranging from resignation, rage, 
detachment and unease or pain to contemplation. Today I'm interested in those images of mumbling beauty that move beyond performative and parodic play. I'm referring to images that reveal the increasing vulnerability of the artist who is not just older but much older, remember, in her 90s. Images that show bourgeois resting on a bed placed in front of a worn door and wall. Images of a visibly frail bourgeois in a wheelchair unable to touch the floor with her feet or bent over behind a walker stumbling around her apartment. And images in which bourgeois is wrapped in textiles and fabrics like a white faux fur coat, an old pink blanket, seemingly unaware of her surroundings or withdrawn in an inner world. What is the potential of an encounter with photographs that do not make an explicit appeal to the viewer to take a better look through, yeah, through this performative play or role play, but that rather have affinities with the conventions of realist photography here used to document a woman approaching her life's end? I felt that as there are so many images in Mumbling Beauty that confront the viewer with the corporeal vulnerability of the subject time and again, it's hard not to be physically touched by and implicated in the self-representations of bourgeois. So therefore, I turned to literature that reintegrates the body in disembodied conceptualizations of vision to improve my understanding of these particular images that highlight bourgeois frailty. One of the scholars that has addressed the visible in the tangible and the tangible in the visible is Amelia Jones. In Jones's view, a photograph of a body is, and I quote, a flesh-like screen that presupposes the depth and materiality of the body as subject. Engaging with a photograph of a body as a flesh-like screen establishes a relation of intercorporeity it is our being looked at by the photograph as flesh that makes us fully corporeal subjects in vision. This being looked at also substantiates the subjectivity of the person in the picture, but always already in relation to us, those it views. From this it follows that we can add transivity of embodiment to the reciprocity of the gaze as was the case when looking at Olaf pinups who look back at us in trying to develop an ethical encounter with these type of images. As Jones writes, plunging into the depths of the image, feeling the flesh of the other as our own imminently mortal corporeal skin is to free ourselves, at least momentarily, in a potentially radically politicizing way from both prejudice and fear, end of quote. The interconnection between the tangible and the visible also seems crucial to the concept of the holding gaze. Donald Winnicott explained the importance of being seen and recognized by another person for the psychological well-beings of humans. In comparing this holding function of looking and being looked at with the interaction between a mother and a child, the connection between vision and body comes again to the foreground. In Winnicott's view, it is in a mother's holding of and gazing at her child that the holding function is enacted. Inspired by his work, disability scholar Rosemary Garland Thompson describes ethical staring as a potential act of beholding of holding the being of another particular individual in the eye of the beholder. For Anka Christofovici, who is a specialist in photography of aging, the holding gaze is when the body becomes too frail to even be touched. In my view, the portraits of a frail bourgeois render her aging femininity physical and tactile, and in doing so, resist our urge to stare or see and instead invite us to touch. And touching is here to be understood in its double meaning, touching, feeling. In absence of other characters in Mumbling Beauty, maybe we could think of the photographer and the viewer, so us, 
holding and holding on to Louise Bourgeois. If abjection can be redeemed through caring, as Gilliard and Hicks suggest, the holding case could be a way to support and continue Bourgeois' presence even after her death. And this brings me to my third example, which is Mum, a documentary about dementia by the Dutch feminist artist Adelheid Rosen. Dementia, as we have heard today, is the most feared prospect of aging, and the objection of people who live with dementia is predominant in our Western society, despite efforts to develop more dementia-friendly communities. For this reason, I move from the portraits of the frail Louise Bourgeois to the images of Mum as developed by her daughter. Documentaries are often used to inform people about what it means to live with dementia. You just have to visit uh, national sites of the Alzheimer's Society, and there's a whole list of books and documentaries to watch. Very little attention is paid to the fact that documentaries do not simply reprodu reproduce the reality that film and audience share, but that they always represent a particular view of this reality. And as such, they run the risk of reinforcing negative stereotypes that induce fear of dementia and that impact the way people with dementia are treated and perceive themselves. And these stereotypes include the positioning of the person who lives with dementia as living dead and the portrayal of the caregiver as the ultimate victim. The documentary Mum does not tell a story of tragic loss and ever-increasing decline, but it gives an impression of some interactions between Rosen's mother and her relatives in scenes that are staged. These are stills from the film. It highlights the here and now of the story world in the sense that from the past of the person with dementia, only her role as a mother is disclosed. Unlike Bourgeois, Mum is not portrayed in solitude, which means that the intersubjectivity on screen can be inspiring for the interaction between the image and the viewer. As the filmmaker Rosen explained in many interviews, Alzheimer's disease offered her the opportunity to come to terms with the strained relationship she used to have with her mother and tune into her world and language. The director intended to make a documentary that would foster some sort of identity politics of Alzheimer's because she is convinced that the personhood of her mother is showing rather than disappearing. This objective resonates with the so-called person movement in dementia research, which reclaims the self in dementia to redefine what meaningful relations are. And I'm now thinking of uh, what you just said about the, role, the importance of sustaining role play in dementia care. So from the moment this documentary aired, um, Mum evoked controversy, big controversy. The explicit images of the vulnerability of Rosen's mother were reportedly hard to watch. A blogger, for instance, wrote that Rosen abused her mother for art's sake and wondered whether the mother, if she had been in full possession of her faculties, would have consented to being filmed wearing an incontinency napkin and talking gibberish. What viewers and reviewers seem to miss, in my view, is that Rosen used a performative documentary mode. Performative qualities such as acting and dramatization have always played a role in the making of documentaries, even though the average viewer may not be aware of it. A performative documentary highlights these performative qualities, which means that it highlights its means of production rather than veiling it in an attempt to address the viewer emotionally. So the genre of the performative documentary aims to evoke a sense of subjectivity that is both personal and social by rendering the under and misrepresented, like people who live with dementia, visible in unexpected ways. Consequently, a performative documentary works against straightforward identification with its main character and a simple response to its subject matter. So let us now focus on a particular still from the documentary, this one. 
as you can see, Rosen's on-screen persona wears, like mum, a black bra, supports stockings, an incontinency napkin, and mirror her modest pose. On the one hand, this has a leveling effect. There seems to be no difference between the caretaker and the patient. The scene suggests a symbiosis between mother and daughter, who fetus-like lay on the red carpet. The hierarchical dichotomy between the person who is ill and the person who is not is deconstructed. On the other hand, the unveiling of the older, frailer versus the younger, fitter woman's body does not make the same kind of spectacle. The viewer knows that Rosen plays a role. She is a director performer embodying mum's dementia. She may get dementia in the future, but this is not her lived reality yet. The picture of sameness is impossible to hold on to, even though I would argue that the mother also plays a role, but a role that to a greater extent is beyond her control. In the documentary's portrayal of physical closeness between mum and her family members, there is plenty of room for mum's agency. The family members are fully engaged in the contact that mum is still able to initiate. And in this respect, it's an interesting choice that the director has subtitled mum's incomprehensible talk. Significantly, the exposure of mum's body comes with a rehabilitation of her voice, as she is almost the sole narrator on the auditive track. The other characters listen to her attentively to assure the viewer that there is intention and meaning behind mum's words, and they never re re reciprocate mum's speech with baby talk. So what the documentary does not do is give us insight into the question whether Rosen's mother has a good life in the nursing home where she resides. That's not its point. Instead, we get a glimpse of what meaningful engagement with a person who lives with dementia could look like. And this engagement takes here a particularly playful and corporeal form. In that sense, mum is a quintessential act of recognition by the daughter director. So, what can we take from these three examples? All these images resist normative and one-dimensional directives about what it means to age successfully. They open up the dichotomy between the third and fourth age and invite us to imagine what lies beyond the quest for eternal youth and the abjection of vulnerable older adults. This way, they help us reimagine what the possibilities could be in the final stages of our life's trajectories. There lie courage and comfort in these particular visibilities of aging femininity that is puzzling, yet beautiful, in its unveiling of change and vulnerability. They may help younger viewers to already come to terms with the mirror images of their future older and much older selves. As such, the photographs are meaning-making practices, responding to a call for an art that helps us envision possibilities beyond the norm or indeed a different future for the norm itself. These images ultimately hold up a mirror to us, inviting us to envision what it could mean to age into deep old age creatively and humanely. Thank you. Thank you, Arje Swinnen. There will be a brief moment of uh, changing the seats and the scenery here up on the stage because there will be five panelists. This was the seventh presentation out of seven very different approaches to age and aging of the individual and society, for that matter, as a whole. 